hands to ask question or yes. is it like <laughs> okay then i'll raise my hand thanks all right welcome everyone to today's google search central seo office hours hangout uh, my name is John Mueller. I am a search advocate at Google here in Switzerland. And part of what we do are these office hour sessions where people can jump in and raise their hands and ask questions. And we have a bunch of questions also submitted on YouTube. But maybe we'll get started with, with the first ones here. Um, let's see. I, I'm not quite sure like how, how the order was originally, because it swapped around a little bit. But I'll just go from the top. I'm sure we'll make it. Uh, Kamal. All right. Um, we have an exam website. Um, people added some exams and uh, give the label for the exams. Uh, and Google indexes all the pages, all the label pages, like tag pages. And it, this, their role is filtering the exams based on the text, based on the topic. And Google indexes all the topics, you know. But is most of them include the same exams, uh, like a duplicate page. And we canonicalized these URLs firstly, but it caused a lot of crawling time for Google. For example, we use the third party tool to crawl all the pages. It was about 100,000 pages. Then we uh, give a no index on robot text and the crawling time degrees and it, it is very fine. But we want to remove some of these pages which indexed by Google. For example, we find them on search results, what we don't find don't want to do that. Uh, how we can do that? We gave no index, and Google cannot access. Mm -hmm. uh, should we remove them one by one, or I I would just leave them as no index. And it's what what will happen is over time when we recrawl those pages, they will drop out. But that that can happen maybe I don't know. Take a couple of months. Uh, but uh, it's not that we would crawl those pages more uh, just because of the no index. Essentially, when we crawl them, we will see the no index, and then we will drop them. And usually, if we see a no index, then we would not crawl them that often. And uh, I, I think with something in the order of 100,000 pages, it just takes a while, but it's not like super, super gigantic and impossible to recrawl. Does it affect negatively to our SEO performance uh, no. in terms of we will see that these are duplicate pages, but canonicalized at the same time? Now is no. an index. No, no, it's it's perfectly fine. It's it's purely a matter of kind of the the crawling side of things. Uh, if we see that they're duplicate, then we will try to treat them as duplicates, and we we will just focus on one canonical URL for them. And yeah, I. So from, from that point of view, I, I will just let it be process, reprocessed and drop out on its own. OK, thank you very much. Sure. Uh, Lagray. Can't hear anything. I think, I think you're still muted. Otherwise, we, we'll come back to you. Like when, whenever. Okay, yeah. So feel feel free to reconnect, and uh, I'll just go to the next one and come back to you when you're ready. Okay, uh, Michael. Hi, John. Um, so you've recommended several times in the past that uh, large sites that they focus on smaller set of pages, um, I guess. Um, so. We, my, the site I'm working on right now, we have a lot of pages that, a lot of pages, like a thousand pages that don't get any traffic, um, that are old. Um, so I've been recommending to remove those. Um, but uh, there's a question that our dev team has that they were under their, the impression that the more pages that Google has indexed of your site, the higher authority it ascribes to the site um, and are reticent to remove any pages. Um, could you shed some light on, on that? Yeah. Um, so it's definitely not the case that if you have more pages indexed that we think your website is better. Uh, so I, I think that, at least, is, is absolutely not, not the case. Um, it's, so, sometimes it makes sense to have a lot of pages indexed. Sometimes they're, they're kind of 
useful pages have indexed like that. Uh, but it's not, not a sign of quality with regards to like how many pages that are indexed. And especially if you're talking about something on the order of, I don't know, 1,000, 2,000, 5,000 pages, that's, that's a pretty low number for, for our systems in general. And it's not that we would say, oh, 5,000 pages is better than 1,000 pages. For us, it's all kind of like, well, it's a, it's a small website, and we, we make do with what we can pull out there. And of, of course, like small website is relative. It's not like saying it's like an irrelevant website. It might be small, but it might still be very useful. Um, but it's certainly not the case that just having more pages indexed is, is a sign of quality. OK, thank you so much. Cool. Uh, Lagre, maybe we'll try you again. There, can you hear me? Yes. Good. Disconnecting from work and connecting from home is, is different. Anyway, um, back in mid-July, we started no noticing a lot of errors in Search Console submitted, um, but no index. The URLs themselves do not have a no index on them, but on the subsequent crawl, they get indexed. The problem is, is that, you know, we get 300 errors, no index, and then on subsequent crawls, only five get crawled before they recrawl, you know, so many more. So given that they are no index, and, and granted, if things can't render or they can't find a page, they're directed to our um, page not found, which does have a no index. And so I know somehow they're getting directed there. Is this just a memory issue or like, since they're able to sub get subsequently crawled fine, is it just a? It's it's hard to say w without looking at the pages. So I I would really try to double check if this was a problem then and is not a problem anymore, or if it's still something that kind of intermittently happens. Uh, because if it if it doesn't matter if it doesn't kind of take place now anymore, then like. No, it, it, it does still take place now. Like it just, okay. it crawled on 10.4 and then on 10.5 it recrawled again. And the ones that got recrawled were indexed fine. Okay. So I don't know if it's caching it somehow or if it was just a memory issue. I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah, my, my hunch w without knowing your site is that something with, with the rendering is sometimes going wrong and it's reaching that error page that you mentioned. And, uh, that's if if that's something that still takes place, I will try to figure out what what might be causing that. And uh, it it might be that like when when you test a page in Search Console, nine times out of ten it works well. Uh, but kind of that one time out of ten when it doesn't work well and redirects to the error page, or we think it redirects to the error page, uh, that's kind of the the case. I will try to drill down into and try to figure out. Is, is it that like there are too many requests to render this page, or there's something complicated with the JavaScript that sometimes takes too long and sometimes works well? And then try to, try to narrow things down from, from that point of view. OK. OK. So, so could it be that if there's too much volume, then the pages couldn't be so many resources are blocked? And so then it looks like page not found. And then when there's less traffic on the website, the resources are able to be rendered? Could be. Yeah, could be. And I, I mean, what, what happens on our side is we crawl the HTML page, mm -hmm. and then we try to process the HTML page in, in kind of the Chromium, kind of Chrome-type browser. And for that, we try to pull in all of the resources that are mentioned on there. So if you go to the, what is it, the, the Developer console in Chrome, and you look at the network section. It shows you like a waterfall diagram of everything that it loads to, right. to render the page. And uh, if if there are lots of things that need to be loaded, then it can happen that things time out, and then we might run into that error situation. Okay. So that's kind of the direction I would go. And if you can't isolate exactly what is going wrong, then I would try to take the number of requests there and just see if there are ways that you can minimize that. Maybe the developer team can combine the different JavaScript files or combine the CSS files, minimize the images, or, or things like that. OK. OK, cool. Thank you. Cool. Uh, Christian. 
Hi, John. It's me again. <laughs> um, yeah, last time uh, we uh, talked about uh, some problems with a website where we have, um, yeah, like an e-commerce website where we have um, informational stuff and transactional stuff. And um, yeah, uh, your advice was to yeah separate uh, these content a little bit and into yeah uh, transaction oriented and uh, information oriented uh, pages. So, but uh, I have another question um, uh, regarding this. Um, if you have a let's say an e-commerce website and you have a, a huge blog or a, uh, yeah a magazine or something like that where you have loads of informational stuff, yeah, but it's a, it's an own section. And on the other hand, you have all these product pages and categories and, and so on. So um, would, would this huge blog with uh, pure informational stuff uh, yeah, give the whole website kind of a, an informational uh, touch or character so that Google says, oh, we are not sure this is, uh, if this is a more yeah, uh, something where people can get information rather than buying stuff. Or is this evalu evaluation done on a per page base? I, I don't think we have that documented or defined. But my, my understanding is that this is more of a page level thing. Uh, because it's, it's, I mean, just purely from trying to think of, of it as, I don't know, a, a practical way, like how you would implement it and look at websites overall. A lot of websites just have a mix of different kinds of content. And uh, then you try to figure out which, which of these pages match the, the searcher's intent and uh, try to rank those appropriately. So my, my feeling is this is something more that would be on a page level rather than on a website level. Okay, so we we don't have the uh, uh, we don't uh, have the risk that yeah by adding more and more uh, yeah text uh, 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 content uh, that we uh, uh, kind of dilute the uh, product uh, pages or something. I I don't think so. Okay. I mean, you you see mm -hmm. that with with news websites often that they have kind of the recent events, but they also have sections for maybe maybe like older events that took place. Mm -hmm, for mm -hmm. I don't know 9/11 or for other big big events, they they kind of have an isolated archive section, and those are very different intents. Like if you want something really now that is happening, or if you want some kind of informational research, evergreen type content, and uh, there too we we kind of have to look at it on a per page basis and not like say oh this is a research website because there's some research content here. All right, cool. Thanks a lot, John. Cool. Um, let's see, Kai Shi. I, I don't know how to pronounce your name. I'm sorry. Uh, just Kai. 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 Yeah. Okay. Uh, sure name. Okay. Um, so John, I have uh, this question for you. Uh, we, uh, we are seeing that people are, are linking to us through through backlinks to our let's say subcategory pages and. Uh, um, the problem is that uh, after some times, you know, our content um, comes and goes, uh, which means that sometimes there is more uh, content appearing in some categories. Sometimes the content gets deleted, and so so subcategories can can be created and can can disappear as well. And uh, uh, we are seeing a bunch of four or fours from from backlinks because they are linking to, to subcategories that no longer exist. My question here is, is it OK to redirect these pe people, uh, these links to the parent category? And, and if we do so, uh, how, how do we do that? With uh, three, three or, or 302, 302, for example, like a temporary redirect, because in the future, this subcategory might might be populated with content again, or it's it's kind of uh, it's not a permanent redirect, you know, yeah. because yeah. yeah. So if 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 we see this this happening at at a larger scale that you redirect kind of to the parent level, we would probably see that as a soft four hundred four, and we would say well. 
the the old page is gone and uh, like instead of a 404 code you're redirecting and maybe that's better for users uh, but we we see it as a 404 okay. uh, so from from a practical point of view i suspect there's little seo difference if you redirect or not um, if if it makes sense from a user point of view to redirect then i i would just go for it uh, it's not that you have a penalty either way so okay. that's kind of, kind of the, the first thing. With regards to 301 or 302, um, I don't think it matters there, because uh, we, we would either see this as a soft 404, or we would see it as a canonicalization question. Uh, mm -hmm. If it's a soft 404, then the code doesn't matter. Uh, if it's a canonicalization question, then it comes down to which URL we show in the search results. And usually, the higher level one will have stronger signals anyway, and we will focus on the higher level one. Yeah. Uh, so that doesn't matter if that's a 301 or a 302 in my, case. My follow-up question to this is basically if, if we do, uh, because uh, we do think it's better for the user uh, to, to see the, the category page instead of a blank page, let's say, say because the, the, the parent category is usually very strongly related to the subject category. So, uh, but my, my, my concern here is if we do this kind of redirection, um, I don't know if it could impact um, future crawling of the subcategory when, when the, when the subcategory appears again, let's say, okay? Because as I said, Content can, can come in again in the subcategory, but if we did a redirect to the parent in the past, Google maybe mm, I don't know, maybe it do doesn't crawl anymore that uh, subcategory. That's my my follow up concern. Yeah, I I suspect there's a minimal difference, but I don't know which one would be better. Uh, so that's that's kind of the the first thing because. If we see it as a soft 404, it would be like a 404. And we would slow down crawling of that particular URL because like, there's nothing here. Why do we have to crawl it every day? Uh, if we see it as a redirect, then we would also say, well, we don't need to crawl this every day uh, because we focus on the primary URL. So I, I think in both of those cases, it, we would slow down crawling of that URL until we get new signals that tell us, actually, this is maybe something new again. Well, and uh, the new signals, I, I think that would be the stronger sign. That would be like internal linking or sitemap file, things like that. Okay. And uh, that would be the stronger sign for us to crawl again. But I think the slowing down of crawling would be similar in, no. in all of these cases. It might be like. Maybe there's a minimal difference between some of them, but I don't know which one would be faster, for example. Okay, okay, okay. but uh, okay, but if we include them again in the same maps, that should be enough to let Google know. Okay, maybe take a look at it. Yeah, I I think sitemaps alone is probably not enough. I would really okay. make sure that the internal linking is also clear. Okay, okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Sure. Uh, Granite. Hey, John. Um, so about a year ago, we saw some significant decrease in traffic. Uh, after the audit, we kind of all the point all the signals pointed to the site having site quality issues. We were able to address those issues by February this year, and by June core update, we saw some increases, but it's still not uh, to the level where we used to be before the decrease uh about a year ago so my question is like the site quality issues if that's been the case is this the recovery that we can expect or can we expect more recovery if we think we've addressed all the issues identified or like is this it i i think the the tricky part here is it's not so much that we would consider it as a situation where you you have to fix something uh, but rather, when, when it comes to relevance, if, if you work on improving the relevance of your website, then you have a different website. You have a better website. So it's not that we would switch back and say, oh, it's like the issue is fixed, and we will change it back to the previous state. But rather, you're saying, well, this is a better website now. And we look at it and say, oh, it's a better website. 
it's not the same or comparable to before. So it, it would be kind of tricky to expect that it changes to the state it was before. Uh, but it's it's a new website. It's it's a better website. Uh, so that's something where when I think, especially with core updates, when you're talking about recovery, it's not so much you're recovering, but rather Google is seeing that you have a better website and reacting to that. Understood. And when we talk about site quality issues, I think like from what we've been able to see, those were like mostly uh let's say technical and user experience issues and not like content quality issues meaning that content wise i think we are very solid but we had more ads than you should have on a page and that's been addressed and overall the user experience has been improved uh which like all the all this and everything that we did like pointed out that for those to be the reason yeah i I think it's it's kind of tricky because with, with the core updates, we we don't focus so much on just individual issues, but rather like the, the relevance of the website overall. And that can include things like the, the usability and the, the ads on a page, but it's essentially the, the website overall. And usually that also means um, kind of the, the focus of the content, the way you're presenting things. Uh, the way you're you're making it clear to users what's behind the content, like where what the sources are, all of these things, all of that kind of plays in. So, just going in and changing like everything around the content, I I think you can probably get some improvements there. But essentially, if you really want Google to see your website as something significantly better, you probably also need to work on the content side and at least from from the focus. Uh, point of view and think about like where where might there be low quality content? Where might users be confused when they go to my website? And is is that confusion something we can address with technical issues, with UX changes, or do we actually have to change some of the content that we present? Understood. And my last question would be if that job came not during a core update, but like a regular period of time, like should you expect for the core updates to happen for you to see a recovery if you are addressing issues? Or should you expect also recoveries to happen in a non-core update period? I I think if you make bigger changes on a website, regardless, you you would see kind of a, a subtle change over time as we reprocess things and re-understand the signals. And if there was something from the core update that was significantly impacting it as well, then you would see a jump during the core update. But at least you should see kind of that subtle improvement over time. Understood. Thank you. Cool. Um, Kamar. Oh my, Good. we have two that are almost the same. <laughs> Go Good ahead. morning. I, I hope this is the right Kamar. Yes. Thank you, John. So my first, uh, my video is off because I'm having some bandwidth issues. My first question, all my questions are small and they are around anchor text. So when we are writing a page on our own website and we curate content, for example, from WebMD, we are taking a snippet and using it as a point of reference. And if we were to give a citation to WebMD, in other words, source URL, I prefer to use it in the footer so when the person is reading it, they don't jump off within the article and jump off to WebMD to learn more. So my user stays on the site. Now, there are two thoughts. Should we give a link back to WebMD or should we not? Because I have not found a reference anywhere that Google wants you to link back. You know, So why should I give any more link that WebMD has that, you know, et cetera? So that was my first question. How, what's the best practice from a Google point of view? Um, I, I think if you're quoting something, then linking to the source always makes sense. So okay. mm -hmm. that's kind of just, just purely mm -hmm. from a usability point of view, I think that would mm -hmm. make sense. Mm -hmm. um, with regards to, to SEO for your mm -hmm. website, mm -hmm. I don't know if you would see any any particular change by by 
specifically linking to other people's websites because it's it's one of those also spammy techniques that used to be used quite a bit where you would create a low quality page and on, on the bottom you would link to cnn and google and wikipedia yeah. uh -huh. and then you would hope well google thinks this is a good page because it links to cnn but and yeah and that's the reason i was talking about linking i gave a reference to webmd their authority but when we are linking to somebody there are some legal issues from an FTC guideline that when you link, you are kind of living, giving a recommendation, and the user might think, okay, okay, I'm going to click here and do something, and then I have received letters from lawyers, hey, stop linking to us because we don't want to be linked. So th that's why I have not linked to people. Okay. So, so I wanted to know from an SEO perspective. Now, the second thing is, if I have a content that is off page, in other words. I wrote a piece of content on LinkedIn and I'm connecting back to my website. And the question is about anchor text. So from an SEO mindset, I can say, okay, I want to link back to my, if, if my page talks about SEO services, I can use an anchor text to learn more, check my SEO services page. Now that's a anchor text that worries me because while it's a great anchor text that would benefit me, from a and from a web accessibility point of view that's the kind of link i should use you know but from an seo it's like over optimization coming back to me so how do i handle that you know uh, coming back because there are risks levels you know i i, I mean usually what what happens is we look at the web and we find all kinds of links Mm -hmm. uh, if if you're creating content on multiple platforms, I would try to use useful useful anchor mm -hmm. text that gives us more mm -hmm. information about the page that you're linking to. Uh, so if if that's like an anchor text that includes SEO services or mm -hmm. whatever, I, yeah. I think that's perfectly fine because usually we we have a wide variety of things kind of linking mm -hmm. around, and some of them will be kind of like click this page, and that's the anchor text, and others will, will have more information about the link. I, I wouldn't necessarily kind of like over worry about uh, mm -hmm. using a good anchor text. Instead, like I, I would try to use good anchor text and like link, link to your content so that it's clear what, what that content is. Also, with, with internal linking, the same thing, and mm -hmm. not say like, well, I, I need to vary my anchor text, or I need to make it look like it's not optimized. Because like with internal linking, users want to know what this link is about. And yeah. you, you want to give that context. So I, I would just include that context. Right. So my point of view of the link is that link is contextual. So wherever I'm linking, I want user to click there and find the right information. Yeah. With the clicked link, you know, doesn't matter. So and that that brings to the third problem. So when it's on LinkedIn, it's more trusted, you know, it's coming back. But now there's a third problem is people are doing guest posts all over. You know, they're going to these low quality sites, they're buying guest posts. So how how does Google determine? And it's like you said, if it's a good anchor text, use it, right? Now, if it's a guest post and Google does not know whether it's paid or not, how will Google then determine that take this link or burn this link? You know, what is the answer? So we are safe from all the angles. Yeah, I mean, if it's a guest post, then mm -hmm. it's a guest post. And our, our guidance for links in guest posts is that they should be no follow. Uh, so if, if you're writing these guest posts to drive awareness to your business, mm -hmm. I, I think that's perfectly fine. I will just yeah. really watch out to make sure that the links are no follow uh, mm -hmm. so that you're, you're driving awareness, you're talking about what you're doing, you're making it so that users can go to your page. But essentially, it's an ad for your business. So. Uh, from that point of view, I would just make them no follow. Uh, with regards to guest posts in general, like how does Google recognize guest posts? I, mm -hmm. I think that's tricky because we we use lots of different signals to try to figure out what what might be a guest post and how we might need to handle that. Uh, but it's it's definitely not the case that it's just like the link anchor text is what makes it problematic. Okay, got it. Thank you so much. That's all. Sure. Cool. OK, um, let, let me just take a quick break with the live questions and go through some of the submitted ones so that we don't lose track. Um, stay tuned. Like, Hang around. We, we'll get to you. Don't worry.
let's see. Um, I think the first one is is an interesting one that, that I got is it's basically historically speaking, SEOs have owned title tags. And recently, Google prefers to show H1 instead of the title tags. And you have to consider that the H1 is a product of a multi-departmental discussion, which might not be exactly what the SEO team wants. Uh, why are you rewriting title SEO titles when you do not do the same for ad titles? Um, why do you do this to SEOs? It's like um, so on, on the one hand, I don't know what what uh, what happens on the PPC or on the ad side. So I can't really speak for that. Uh, but in general, I, I think it's a kind of a, a tricky mindset to say that uh, SEOs own one particular part of the page, and that is always mapped one to one in this part of the search results, because these things change over time, and uh, it's it's something like the the structured data that that is processed can change over time. In the past, it was that you would use microdata and things that are embedded within the HTML for structured data. Now, a lot of people use JSON LD, which is kind of separate. Um, but all of these things, they, they evolve over time. It's not the case that you can always say, for any given HTML page, this is exactly what the SEO will do, and this is exactly what the developers will do and what the content team will do. Uh, th these things just evolve over time. Uh, so from, from my point of view, it's not so much that we're doing this to, to annoy the SEOs, but rather we're trying to improve the quality of the search results so that Ultimately, people search more. And when people search more, they go to your websites more. That's kind of essentially our goals here. So it's, it's not the case that uh, people at Google sit around and go like, oh, like how can I annoy SEOs this week? Um, that's definitely not, not what we do or what we spend our time on. Uh, we have so many other normal business problems and work problems and technical problems to work on. And we try to improve the quality of our services. And uh, sometimes that affects what SEOs do. Uh, sometimes that doesn't. And when it does affect what SEOs do, we do try to let me, you know about uh, these kind of changes. Um, I think the submitted no index, we talked about that. Briefly, um, let's see. If there are two competing e-commerce sites that sell exactly the same product, one website offers a product at $500, the other at $100, all SEO signals are equal, uh, would the less expensive website have a better chance of ranking because there's such a price difference uh, for the exact same product? Um, so purely from a web search point of view, no. It's not the case that we would try to recognize a price on a page and use that as a ranking factor. Uh, so it's, it's, not, it's not the case that uh, we, we would say, we'll take the cheaper one and, and rank that higher. Um, I, I don't think that would really make sense. However, a lot of these products also end up in uh, kind of the, the product search results, uh, which could be because you submit a feed, or it could be because we recognize the product information on these pages. And the, the product search results, I don't know how they're ordered. It might be that they take the price into account, uh, or things like availability, all of the, the other factors that kind of come in as attributes into product search. Uh, so from a web search point of view, we don't take the price into account. From a product search point of view, it's possible. And the, the tricky part, I think, as an SEO is these different aspects of search are often combined in one search results page, where you'll see normal web results, and maybe you'll see some product results on the side, uh, or maybe you'll see some, some mix of that. Uh, so that's kind of looking at that. Um, if we have 200 sitemap files and 20 to 30% of the URLs jump from one file to another every week, how bad can it be? Uh, or should we strictly keep our URLs in the same file forever? Uh, so how bad can it be is like hard to say, because it's we don't really have a measure for badness when it comes to sitemap files. Um, but we, we would generally try to, or our recommendation is usually to keep the same URL in the same sitemap file. Uh, the, the main reason for that is we process sitemap files at different rates. 
Uh, so if you move one URL from one second final to another, it might be that we have the same URL in our systems from multiple sitemap files. So, and if you have different information for this one URL, like different change dates, uh, for example, uh, then we would not know which, which attribute to actually use. Uh, so from that point of view, if you have it always in the same sitemap file, then it's a lot easier for us to say, oh, we have the information for this URL here. And we can trust that information because it's only there. Uh, so that's something where I try to avoid it, like these URL shuffling around randomly. Uh, but at the same time, it's usually not going to break processing of your sitemap file. And it's definitely not going to have a, a ranking effect on your website. Uh, so there's nothing in our sitemap system that kind of maps to the quality of a website. Uh, I'm learning SEO from multiple sources, and it feels like a behemoth of information. Uh, do you have a preferred SEO checklist uh, that will help make the workflow more efficient? This is in regards to launching a website for small businesses or helping existing businesses boost their SEO. Um, so wow, yeah, I don't think we have any SEO checklists. So that makes it a little bit harder to, to get started. What I would recommend doing is looking at the various SEO starter guides that are out there. So we have an SEO starter guide. Uh, they're from various SEO tools. There are also starter guides available that are usually pretty good. And for the most part, the starter guides that I've seen, they have, they have correct information. So it's, I, I think, a lot less the case that uh, people publish something incorrect when it comes to especially the, the beginning side of SEO. So I, I would try to go through those and think about which aspects actually play a role or matter for your website. The, the tricky part, I think, with all of these starter guides, at least the ones that I've seen, is they're often based on an almost old school model of websites where you create HTML pages. And for the most part, small businesses, when they go online, they don't create HTML pages anymore. They go into WordPress or into Wix or into any of the, the other common uh, hosting platforms. And they create their pages by putting text in and dragging images in and all of these things. And they don't really realize that in the back there's actually an HTML page. So sometimes when you go through these starter guides, it can feel very technical and not really map to what you're actually doing when you're creating these web pages. Because when we talk about title elements, uh, for example, you don't look at the HTML anymore and try to tweak that, but rather you try to find the, the field in your whatever hosting system that you have and think about what you need to put there. Uh, so that's something where I, I think over time, things will probably shift a little bit to, to kind of cover that area a little bit better. Uh, but it's something to kind of keep in mind, that the SEO starter guides, when you look at them, they might feel like super technical. But actually, the work that you do is a lot more like filling in fields and making sure that the links are there and, and things like that. Um, let's see. I work in the news vertical. My team is looking to expand our international presence and have done work to set up multi-regional subdirectories. For the most part, pages across the different multi-regional editions will look the same. Uh, homepage and section pages, like politics or lifestyle, uh, will have similar content minus a few pieces unique to the region. Uh, the articles are tricky. There is not much we can differentiate across multi-regional subdirectories outside of modules uh, with, let's see, related links, which leaves us worried that duplicate content issues. How does Google handle duplicate content in the news space? Is it acceptable? The content stays the same, but elements of the template are different. Should there only be one canonical across all multi-regional websites? Wow, OK. Lots, lots of different uh, aspects there. So I, I think taking a step back first, it sounds like these are different regions within the same country. And it's same language content. Uh, so for, for example, I don't know, different US states or different regions within the UK, for example, something like that. Um, if these are different countries, then you have the aspect of geotargeting, which plays a role. If these are different languages, so if you're working, say, in, in Europe and you're covering Germany and France and Italy or something like that, then you have different languages as well. Uh, 
that's also a very different aspect. But if you're talking about within the same country, same language content, uh, then on the one hand, it's a little bit easier because you don't have to worry about all of these technical connections. Uh, but on the other hand, the duplicate content issues are a lot, lot more visible. And when, when it comes to duplicate content, the, the tricky aspect on, on sites like these is that you essentially end up competing with yourself. And if you have one news article that you publish across, I don't know, five or six different region, regional websites, then all of these different regional websites try to rank for exactly the same article. And that could result in that article just not ranking as well as it otherwise could. Uh, so because of that, I would recommend trying to find canonical URLs for these individual articles uh, so that you can really say, well, I have this one article on my five regional websites, but this is my preferred version that I want to have seen in search. And then we can concentrate all of our energy, all of our signals on that one preferred version, and we can try to rank that one a little bit better. Uh, it doesn't have to be the same version all the time. Uh, so it can definitely be the case that you have one news article that is within one region, kind of the canonical, and a different news article is more canonical for another region. How you pick which region you choose as canonical is totally up to you. It can be completely random if you want, but usually you would do try to figure out like where is it the most relevant and pick that one as the canonical version. Uh, so that's for, I think, the, diff the individual articles themselves. For the categories and the sections and the home pages, it seems like that would be something where the content is more unique and more specific to the individual regions. And uh, because of that, I would try to just keep those indexable separate. Uh, so if you have five different regional websites, their home page, their category sections, they would all be individually indexed. And the news articles themselves would be mapped to one of these different regions. Uh, so that's, that's kind of the, the approach that we recommend there. Um, people do it in, in lots of different variations. And uh, this approach also, just I, I guess if you're curious, also works across different domain names. Uh, so if you have different domains for individual regions, but it's all a part of the same news group, you can still do kind of this canonical shifting across the different versions. Uh, if you're doing it within the same domain with subdirectories, that's fine too. Um, let's see, HTML semantics versus SEO optimization. Um, the the question kind of goes into uh, like on on e-commerce product pages should the title of the product be, be marked up as a heading. And uh, from, from our point of view, that's totally up to you. Uh, from purely a technical point of view, it can be the case that the product is a heading on a page. I, I think that makes sense in a lot of cases, because you have kind of your business maybe as a heading. You have the product or the, the kind of product that it is as a heading that seems to, to make total sense from a semantic point of view. So that's kind of what, what I would focus on there. So less trying to squeeze kind of semantics into what works well for SEO, but rather trying to do what makes sense uh, from a semantic HTML point of view. And usually that maps fairly well to, to search as well. Um, is Google Discover's personalization based on Google Search only or also on YouTube and other Google products? Um, I, I didn't know offhand. So I looked at the Help Center content for Google Discover, and it mentions that it's essentially based on the, the searches that you do. So you have to enable, um, I think, uh, whatever the feature is that uh, enables the, the search history in your account uh, so that that works. And that kind of suggests to me that it's based on your search history. Um, I don't know how, how like the other Google products map into that. My assumption is just purely from a data protection point of view, it would be tricky to map kind of other products into something like that. So I kind of doubt that is happening. Um, what is the best course of action to take uh, when you have to 301 redirect all of the URLs to a new set of URLs? 
uh, the number of pages will be over 1 million, and you want to minimize the sandbox effect. Uh, if there is a sandbox effect, how long could it be? Uh, would we lose ranking that we might never recover? We plan on doing a one-to-one -one redirect and had requested batch redirects, uh, but that's not a possibility. Uh, so pages, images, URLs, et cetera, would have to flip at the same time. Um, to me, this sounds like a, a traditional site move situation. You move from one domain to another, and you redirect all of the URLs from your old site to a new one. And we, we have to deal with that. And there is, at least from my point of view, there is nothing like a sandbox effect. There is definitely nothing defined as a sandbox effect on our side when, when it comes to site moves. So if you have to do a site move, then do a site move. Then redirect all of your pages. Um, it's, it's often like the, the easiest approach is just to redirect all pages at once. Uh, our systems are also tuned to that a little bit to try to recognize that. So when we see that a website starts redirecting all pages to a different website, then we'll try to reprocess that a little bit faster so that we can process that site move uh, as quickly as possible. And it's definitely not the case that we would say, oh, they're doing a site move. Therefore, we will slow things down. But rather, we try to process things actually a little bit faster when we recognize there is a site move. Um, I have a website that connects to APIs on a client side to get data. Uh, are those URLs being included in the crawling budget? If you disallow those URLs, uh, this would, create, would that create any issues? Um, so I, I think there are two things here. On, on the one hand, if these APIs are included when a page is rendered, then yes, they would be included in the crawling. And they would count towards your site but your, your crawl budget, essentially, uh, because we, we have to crawl those URLs to render the page. You can block them by robots text uh, if you prefer that they're not crawled or not used during rendering. Uh, Totally up to you if you if you prefer doing that, especially if you have an API that is kind of costly to maintain or takes a lot of resources, then sometimes that makes sense. Uh, the tricky part, I guess, is if you disallow crawling of your API endpoint, we won't be able to use any data that the API returns for indexing. Uh, so if your page's content comes purely from the API and you disallow crawling of the API, we won't have that content. Uh, that's kind of the, the one aspect there. Uh, if the API just does something supplementary to the page, like maybe draws a map or, I don't know, a, a graphic of a, a numeric table that you have on a page or something like that, then maybe it doesn't matter if that content isn't included in indexing. Uh, the other thing is, is that sometimes it's non-trivial how a page functions when the API is blocked. Uh, in particular, if you use JavaScript and the API calls are blocked uh, because of robots text, then like, you have to handle that exception somehow. And uh, depending on how you embed the JavaScript on the page, what you do with the API, you need to make sure that it still works. So if that API call doesn't work and then the rest of the page's rendering breaks completely, then like, we can't index much because there's nothing left to render. However, if the API call breaks and we can still index the rest of your page, then that might be perfectly fine. So those are kind of the, the options there. I think it's trickier if you run an API for other people, because if you disallow crawling then, then you kind of have this second order effect that someone else's website might be dependent on your API. And depending on what your API does, then suddenly their website doesn't have indexable content. And they might not even notice because they, they weren't aware that suddenly you added a disallow there. And uh, that might cause kind of like uh, indirect effects. Uh, but that's ultimately all up to you. Cool. OK. Um, still a bunch of questions submitted, but also lots of people's hands. Maybe I'll go back to, to some hands uh, until we kind of finish the recording here. And I also have some more time afterwards, so we, we can try to answer all of the questions. Uh, Kumar. Hi, John. So Hi. John, I have also added my question, the main question that I had on the question list on YouTube channel. So I'll, I'll repeat the question. So, there are two pages that originate from the same domain 
the url is bit different which will be part of the same directory structure and the way they are generated they are generated by next js so next js is a server side rendered react framework and they are being indexed but i see one page in the google cache and the second page is not in the google cache and i see the same pattern regardless of how i generate the page okay and uh, i mean there is no set pattern that this would be in google cache this would not be in google cache most of my pages are in google cache but now i am worried because i am uh, currently moving from my java based tech stack which generates all these pages to uh, total next years and uh, this 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 problem is uh, while i was debugging i found that this is also a problem with the older java stack that we were using so the question is two parts basically why this behavior and second is uh, will this behavior impact my ranking i see those pages appearing in search results okay which are not in google cache web cache but will will it uh, impact my uh, rankings okay i have another question but this is important okay uh so so first of all the the cache pages are completely separate from what we index uh okay. so if if a there is a cache page or not it doesn't matter at all for ranking it doesn't matter it, at all for indexing uh sometimes there are technical reasons why we don't have a cache page sometimes we we just don't have a cache page for individual urls uh the other thing is if the page is using a javascript framework then mm -hmm. Whether or not that JavaScript runs on a cache page is sometimes tricky, uh, because the cache page is hosted on a Google domain. Uh, depending on what kind of JavaScript you have, where it pulls the JavaScript files in, sometimes the JavaScript can't run on the kind of Google domain. And uh, from that point of view, if you look at the cache page, then it can look like, oh, it's an empty page. And maybe Google is indexing an empty page. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we would index an empty page. It's just, well, the JavaScript can't run on this page. Because the, the cache page is not the rendered page. It is essentially just the HTML file that we requested and a copy of that. And if the HTML right. file shows something, that's fine. If it uses JavaScript and the JavaScript doesn't run because it's a cached page, that's equally fine. You just don't see it in the cache page. Uh, so John, the challenge is when I uh, search this in Google Web Cache, right? I get a 404. Google tells me that this page is not in the cache. So typical 404 page that you see for web page in the domain, right? So and uh, the same page, okay? The the structure of the the JavaScript file, the structure, everything is same. In the the URLs that I've given in the question, okay, the structure and everything is same. It's just the content that is varying. Are you saying that because while Google was indexing and was requesting that HTML, there was a problem with JavaScript, that's why it did not cache? What could be the reason? I, I just want to get to the bottom of this because there are I have around uh, um, hundred thousand categories which I need to enable. Then corresponding to hundred thousand categories, around two hundred thousand products that I need to enable. And although what you said is correct, my SEO team has said that this this won't matter. OK, but it is still a problem for me. I, something that I don't understand is a problem. I, I cannot find a reason. And uh, it is giving me ABGBs, if you understand. Yeah. I Like the, the cache page, I, I would not worry about it at all. It's, it's a completely si separate system at Google. Uh, so oh. we have kind of the system for indexing and ranking. And the system for cache, the cache pages is completely separate. So if, if the cache page doesn't show, I would not worry about that. That's, that's not a sign of any issue. And mm -hmm. uh, often, it's also something you can't control uh, if there is a cache page or not. Uh, so I, I would just ignore that. OK, sounds good to me. Uh, second is around uh, dynamic rendering. So before we move to Next.js, we had a regular React application. I am a, more of a tech guy. I'm not an XC expert. But then uh, going through certain articles on uh, developers.google.com, I found that there is, a, there is a headless browser tool called RenderTron. Um, maybe you have heard about it, right? So uh, do I, uh, looking at that tool, does it mean that I don't need to look at uh, server-side rendering frameworks like Next.js, where Google is also investing a lot of money, right? Google sponsors Next.js. 
so should i stop looking at this and should i simply get react generate my single page application and then use rendertron for when google bots hit me i redirect that traffic to rendertron which will serve them the rendered page that is okay i i can't give you advice like which approach would be better because i i think it depends a lot on the different factors that that are around your website However, mm -hmm. I, I would strongly recommend you join one of Martin's office hours. Uh, so, so Martin on my team does JavaScript-based office hours. I think okay. every, every other week or once a month, something like that, I, mm -hmm. I would watch out for those and join one of those and ask him directly and see if he can take a look at your site, uh, maybe some of the specifics from your pages, and uh, if, if he can give you some more specific advice there. So because this, I mean, technically, the, these approaches should both work. It's not that one works and the other one doesn't, or that one is better than the other. Mm. Uh, but it might be that <clears throat> one is is easier in your specific case. Okay, uh, mine is an e-commerce website, but okay, what you're saying is I'll join Martin's uh, yeah. office hours. Yeah. Uh, that's that's all I had, John. And thanks a lot for your time. Thanks. Cool. Good luck. Um, Anna. Hi, John. Nice to see you for the first Hi. time. Um, as you you might have seen, I have a question on, on that YouTube uh, site. The thing is that we have in Google Search Console two domains. And um, like in September, everything was working fine as the Google Search Console only uh, saved last 16 months, right? And for some reason, like in the other domain, it just saved uh, like in the in that console only twelve months. I thought it was just like um, maybe the 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 website or reporting uh, problem, but we have also a connection uh, to export those data to Kebula, and we also seen those changes there that it's saving just on uh, just twelve months. Uh, and I'm not sure who else should I contact because we don't have uh, any local support in Czech Republic. Yeah, I, I don't think you can change that. So that's kind of the, the first problem. Usually, this comes uh, from a situation where the website was verified before and lost verification mm -hmm. and uh, then was verified again. And probably like 12 months ago was maybe when, when the verification happened again. And usually when the website loses all verification, then we stop processing the data. And we start processing again when it's verified again. Uh, whereas if a website was never verified at all, then we try to recreate all of the old data. Uh, so it's, it's a kind of a, I don't know, one of those situations where you're stuck essentially with, with the data that you have available there. It's not that you can recreate that old data. What you could try, I, I don't know if it works, uh, is to try to verify a subsection of your website. So if you have a subdirectory or a subdomain, uh, or instead of doing the domain verification, doing the specific host name verification, uh, see if that will trigger kind of like regenerating the, the rest of the data. Uh, but uh, usually, you you would just have to kind of I don't know keep keep it as is, and in the future, like it'll fill up again to the eighteen months, but it won't regenerate the old data. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Well, as uh, I forgot to mention, I'm a web analyst, and uh, like my colleague is the uh, guy from C C S E O. So I think that if I told him that to try to verificate those sub. Um, subdomains, then he, he should know what to do. Yeah. Usually, usually it's easy to just add those separately. But mm -hmm. I, I can't guarantee that it'll regenerate the data. I, I think it should, but I'm, I'm not 100% sure. Yeah. Uh, this change we've noticed, like it, it happened maybe like two weeks ago. And on September, everything was working fine. We've seen like the six month, uh, last six month data. But like in this month, uh, everything like it like those four months just disappeared. So that's why I yeah. have this question. Yeah, it's it's annoying. I I wish I wish it's something that we would handle differently in Search Console, but yeah, you know, at, at the moment it's not something that you can kind of like recreate force it to recreate that. Mm -hmm. 
Mm, yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, that's that's all. Uh, thank you for your cool. All right. Answers. Thanks a lot. Uh, cool. Um, I will take a break here with the recording, and I'll still be here for for more of the questions. It looks like a bunch of hands are still up. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube, thanks for sticking around to the end. If you'd like to join one of these in the future, watch out in the community section uh, on our channel for for the next versions of the the office hours. And uh, with that, let me take a break here and hope to see you all again in one of the future ones.